As a Baal's tshuva, many of my coping skills were developed when I was immersed in secular culture, namely secular music and watching television shows. These behaviors are not in line with the rest of my ashkafa nor my communities. I've tried repeatedly to stop in various ways, only to find myself lacking the ability to cope with the many stressors in my life. Music and shows are my relaxations, my return to equilibrium. I don't pretend to believe this is ideal, but they are coping behaviors that go very, very far back, and I've never found suitable replacements. Jewish music does not have the same effect, nor does watching shiurim. There is a part of me that wants to accept that I simply need these behaviors and feel okay about it, and much of the time I do, but occasionally I get inspiration to be better, and I feel sadness that despite all the ways that I've removed myself from my secular upbringing, I can't feel satisfied, satisfied without these. I've gone as long as a year without, but now, when daily life is so stressful, it's my only real outlet, and I feel that stopping will result in resentment for the rest of my religious life. What do you recommend? Okay, this is, this is a billion-dollar question. Really, really important. Um, and when you hear the answer, it might initially uh, strike you as controversial, but you're going to see what I'm going to say is very, very firmly rooted. Um, I hope the person who asked this question is on the line because I would, I would love to take questions on this after I, after I present the basics. Um, okay, what I'm gonna what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna I'm gonna go with you into the primary sources that deal with this terrible Yetzahara, this terrible evil inclination that we have to listen to secular music. And let's see if we can get clarity on where secular music stands in a Jew's life from a halachic perspective. And I think that will probably resolve the whole problem for you as soon as you see what, what, how the halacha treats secular music. Okay, so let's start like this. There is a spectrum of approaches to music generally uh, in the, the writings of our sages, in the writings of the, the Rishonim, the medieval commentators, the one end of the spectrum, uh, the most strict end, is Rambam, Maimonides, writing in Hilchus Tainios, uh, the fifth chapter of the 14th halacha. He says like this, he says, in the, in the shadow of the destruction of the base of Migdash, the rabbis prohibited playing musical instruments of any type of songs or enjoying making any sort of music or listening to songs because of the mourning of the temple's destruction. And even just vocals, that's a cappella without instruments, are forbidden while drinking wine. As the verse says in Isaiah, in song you should not drink wine. So, what do I have here? The Rambam, Maimonides, forbids the use of any musical instruments, and a cappella he only permits when there's no wine being consumed, and that is not just uh, during the three weeks of mourning for Beis Amigdash. This is 365 days a year. The Rambam held you were not allowed to play musical instruments, period. Okay, Rav Moshe Feinstein says that that is not the halacha. We do not paskin like the Rambam. He says that people who are on a high madrega, the balei nefesh, should conduct themselves in accordance with this passage in the Rambam. But that is the most strict of all opinions, and Ramosha Feinstein says that is not the halacha for all Jews. In other words, Ramosha Feinstein does permit Jews to play musical instruments and, of course, to listen to the music that's produced. Okay. Now, that's one extreme end of the spectrum, the Rambam, let's call it the right end of the spectrum, on the left side of the spectrum. So, you have to be very, very careful. This is the, the leftmost opinion. You have to be very, very careful to give individuals advice not to listen to music, knowing that if they try to follow that, it could stress them, and they may end up resentful and rebellious. And that could lead that person, a child or an adult, 
to much more serious spiritual disintegration. Revolba writes in the Ali Shur, Chalik Base, page 190, quote, A person who accepts upon himself some great behavior that weighs upon him, over time, he will acutely feel the force of rebellion burgeoning within himself. So, Revolve acknowledges that on the left side of the scale, there could be people for whom you cannot forbid music. You may have to allow all sorts of music in order for them not to be stressed. Okay, now, that's a very broad, vague presentation of the spectrum. Okay, now let's get practical. Once upon a time, a very serious disagreement about what kind of music we're allowed to listen to broke out between two Rishonim, two medieval scholars, both very famous. One was Rabbi Huda Levi. He's the author of the Kuzari. He was a poet. Uh, you're no doubt familiar with uh, Yom Shabbason, a Shabbos song that he wrote. He wrote more than 300 poems and songs, and a considerable number of them are love songs. Uh, for example... Uh, one poem that he wrote reads as follows. Wondrous is this land to see with perfume in its meadows laden. But more fair than all to me is yon slender... It, bl it blinked out just from the beginning of the poem. Sorry. Ah, so I'll read from the beginning of the poem. The poem reads, Wondrous is this land to see with perfume its meadows laden. But more fair than all to me is yon slender, gentle maiden. He's talking about a pretty girl. Now, that's not so bad. Some of his other love poetry is so explicit, so shockingly explicit, that it, it describes body parts that even in our society are normally covered. I, now, I, I, I'll read to you the poem in Hebrew, but it's hard for me to read it to you in English. This is a, a love song the Rabbi Yehuda Levi, the author of the Kuzari, wrote for the wedding of the Re Magash, a uh, contemporary of his. Uh, if you want to find this, it's called Basulis Bas Yehuda, and it's in a book called Lekute Shirim of Rabbi Yehuda Levi. Okay. This is Piyut Ches, the eighth song, and it's for the wedding of Rabbi Yosef Halevi min, uh, Ben Migash. And it reads in Hebrew, Yididi tzamchu beganot adne adanim shnei shadaim netunim heim lecha netunim vayom lamana liyadcha hena nechonim. Now, I'm not going to translate that, but it is X-rated poetry written by Rabbi Huda Levi. Okay. One opinion you have is Rabbi Huda Levi who felt that there was nothing wrong with a love song. Even a love song as explicit as this. Okay, the Rambam is on the other side. And the Rambam said, this is highly inappropriate. And he is the, he's the machmer here. He's the strict one. And then, even though he said it's highly inappropriate, in his, in his, in his commentary to Pirkei Avos, to the Ethics of the Fathers, in the first chapter of the 17th Mishnah, the Rambam has this whole discussion about music. And there, he divides all prose, poetry, music into five categories. There's music or poetry, which is a mitzvah to compose and perform. There's music and poetry, which is forbidden. There is music and poetry, which is permitted, but he calls it disgusting, even though it's permitted. There is music and poetry, which is not just uh, permitted, but it's beloved, and then there's music and poetry, which is permitted, but it's not beloved. It's just par of. It's like, it's okay. Okay. And then, after dividing all music into these five categories, Maimonides writes as follows. Now, this is in his commentary to Pirkei Avos. You can go look this up. You must know, tighten your seatbelt for this. This is unbelievable. You must know that songs, regardless of the language in which they are composed, must be evaluated in terms of their lyrical content to see which of the five categories described above they fall into. By the way, I think this is a veiled attack on Rehuda Levy's love poems. I am making this explicit, even though it is self-evident, because 
I have seen elderly scholars and pious individuals from our Torah world who attend a wedding or similar simcha see someone who desires to sing an Arabic song even when the content of that song praises self-control or generosity which would fall into the category of beloved and they do all they can to distance that song and prevent it from being sung and they say it is forbidden to listen to Arabic music however the Rambam goes on in other words the Rambam is critical of those people who they hear an Arabic song with beautiful lyrics really praiseworthy lyrics that would make a person into a better person there these the Rambam is critical of those people who would say that there's something wrong with that Arabic song the Rambam feels that there's nothing wrong with that Arabic song however he says if a singer performs a Hebrew song like Rehuda Levi's songs they will not distance that song or look badly upon its performance even though the lyrics might contain themes that would fall into the categories of forbidden or permitted but disgusting which is where the Rambam would like to put Rabbi Huda Levi's love poetry so the Rambam is, has said that there are these foolish people who they ban Arabic songs because they're Arabic songs they permit Hebrew songs just because they're Hebrew songs and they ignore the lyrics and the Rambam continues and says this is pure foolishness for prose and poetry is not forbidden permitted beloved disgusting or commanded based on its language but rather based on its theme for if the song's theme is exalted we are obligated to sing it regardless of the language in which it was composed and if the song's theme is degraded it is forbidden to sing it regardless of the language in which it was composed okay now that's the end of the Rambam realize here the Rambam is the strict opinion because he's coming to ban the love songs of Yudha Levi however it comes out from something the Rambam saying that Arabic songs now notice he doesn't say a song in Arabic that's written in the Arabic language he's talking about an Arabic song that was composed by an Arab he says if it has a praiseworthy worthy theme there is nothing wrong with that song whatsoever and he says that just because a Jew composed the song or, or composed and sang the song that doesn't make the song kosher it all depends on content so you now have the Rambam coming out saying that what you and I call secular music might be okay depending on the content of the song okay that's Rambam Rashi and the Marsha take the exact same position the it, they're writing in another place they're writing it on, on a, a Gemara in Hagiga the Talmud in tractate Hagiga page 15 15 B is telling the story of a Talmudic scholar Rabbi Elisha Ben Abuya who he went off the derech he left Torah and the Gemara asks like why why didn't Rabbi Elisha Ben Abuya's Torah protect him from corruption he knew a lot of Torah why didn't why did why did how was it he knew so much Torah and, and he still ended up leaving Orthodox Judaism and the Gemara answers you know what it was Zemer Yavani lo pasak mi punya he was always walking around singing a Zemer Yavani a Greek song okay so now here is the source if we were ever going to find a source this is a Talmudic passage that says there's a problem with secular music no it says the reason he left Torah was he was singing a Greek song look at what Rashi does Rashi says why what was the problem here Rashi says it wasn't that it was a Greek song it was the Zemer Yavani lo pasak me pumya. he was always singing a Greek song what does it mean always singing a Greek song Rashi says that there is a rabbinic prohibition on listening to music after the destruction of the temple or uh, if you're drinking wine then then even without ins musical instruments you can't even have a cappella. and Rashi says that the reason why Elisha Ben Abuya left is because he ignored the rabbinic prohibition on listening to music why doesn't Rashi just say that he was singing a Greek song 
he was listening to secular music. And the answer is because Rashi understands that that would never have corrupted Alicia Benabuya. If he was listening to wholesome Greek songs, that wouldn't have been a problem. The, the, the problem was that he was listening to music at a time when it was prohibited. But listening to a Greek song, that's not the problem. The, the Marsha looks at the same Talmudic passage and he gives a different explanation but comes out with the same conclusion. His explanation is, yeah, the problem was it was a Greek song. You know why? Because the Greek songs were filled with heresy. And since they were filled with heresy, he got heresy into his heart by singing songs with bad content. But according to the Marsha, if it had good content, there would have been nothing wrong with listening to a Greek song. Both Rashi and the Marsha have no problem with a song composed by a Greek, sung by a Greek, etc. None of that's a problem. The whole problem is that either we weren't supposed to be listening to music at all, according to Rashi, or according to the Marsha, that it had bad lyrics. Okay, so you've got the Rambam, who permits secular music. You have Rashi, who permits it. You have the Marsha, who permits it, as long as the, 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 the lyrics are wholesome. Uh, what about modern postgame? So, Rav Moshe Feinstein was asked whether or not you're allowed to listen to songs that were composed by Christians and idol worshippers. And in the Geras Moshe, Yordea, Chelek Beis, page 77, he responds and he says, if you recognize that the composer's intention was not to play for religious worship, but rather just to play for the pleasure of music, let me repeat, if the composer's intention was that the song should be for pleasure, that although the composer is a Christian or an idol worshiper, there is no prohibition on such music. In, in another case, Rav Moshe Feinstein was asked uh, a more controversial question. There was a, a tremendous Torah scholar who was also a musician. And uh, in the second half of his life, he became involved in some things that were very controversial. Uh, things that had to do with men and women being together, and it was very, very controversial. And someone wrote a letter to Rav Moshe asking if it was permitted to listen to the songs that he composed before he, he, he started doing these controversial things. And Rav Moshe goes way beyond that. He says... In the matter of a person who was a Ben Torah in good stature for several years and was a musician who composed holy songs and songs for weddings and whose songs many B'nai Torah were accustomed to sing at religious celebrations but whose character is no longer good for he gathers young men and women together and sings before them. You ask if it is now permitted to sing the songs he first composed when he was an upright religious Jew. Ramosh Feinstein says, In my humble opinion, I do not see any prohibition. Furthermore, this is the key, furthermore, I, Rav Moshe Feinstein, have a fundamental doubt whether the prohibition of bequeathing celebrity to evil people applies to a case where the songs composed are kosher, containing nothing inappropriate. For it is logical that the Rambam only forbid bequeathing celebrity to an evil person by giving notoriety to his acts of holiness, like writing a Sefer Torah. If an evil person wrote a Sefer Torah, then that would be a problem. We couldn't use that Sefer Torah. However, since publicizing an association with a secular matter does not grant someone genuine stature, there is no prohibition to the music that this person composed, just that it is obviously acceptable to use medical innovations and other technologies created by evil people. A song that was written for pleasure is no worse than a medical innovation or a technology that was created by someone who is doing things that are inappropriate. We would never swear off a drug that was made up by somebody who is inappropriate. And even to refer to those innovations using the evil person's name is okay. So you can even say, this song was written by Beryl Schmerl. And you're, you're giving him publicity through that, but that's okay. You can publicize somebody who creates a medication or a technology or a song. We see, Ramosha continues, that just regarding holy matters is it problematic to grant evil people celebrity by way of association by saying this Torah was written by Beryl Schmerl who was doing bad things. But not with secular matters. Since songs also qualify as secular matters, he concludes, for they contain no 
holiness whatsoever, despite the fact that their lyrics sometimes have holy content. Hear what he's saying. Ramosha Feinstein here is writing that a Jewish song, which is writing about holy things, that song contains no holiness whatsoever. And therefore, it is possible that singing such songs does not violate the prohibition on granting evil people celebrity and holy matters, since the essential song he composed has no holiness. Therefore, even those songs he composed after he became corrupt are probably not forbidden to perform. So now what we've got is not only is it okay to have a song that's according to Rambam and Rashi and the Marsha and Rav Moshe Feinstein, it's okay to have a song that was composed by a non-Jew. Even more, it's okay to have a song composed by a non-Jew or even a Jew who was doing terrible things even at the time that they wrote the song. That song does not contain the spirituality of that person. That's what Rav Moshe Feinstein is saying. So it turns out that the only index of the acceptability of a song is the lyrics. Okay, now, what we call secular music, which is such a terrible thing that all Jews have to get away from it, so far we have not seen a single mainstream source that prohibits it. And if this isn't upside down enough, what's about to follow will, it'll give you vertigo. There is a, a tour prohibition on certain types of lyrics, songs that have certain types of lyrics. Now, you and I know what kind of lyrics that is. Uh, according to the Kuzari, according to Buda Levi, a love song would probably be okay. Uh, even though the Rambam doesn't believe a love song would be okay. But nevertheless, okay, there is a Rishon who says that a love song could be okay. But there are probably lyrics that talk about how good it is to steal or how violence is, is a good thing or something like that. And those would all be unacceptable lyrics. But there's another type of unacceptable lyric that you will not believe. The Gemara in Sanhedrin, the Talmud in Tractate Sanhedrin, page 101, reads as follows. The rabbis taught, one who reads a verse from the Song of Songs, from Shira Shirim, and makes it into a musical composition, brings evil to the world. For the Torah girds herself in sackcloth, stands before the Holy One, blessed be He, and declares, Master of the universe, your children have made me like a violin that is played by jesters. Okay, what you have here is a Talmudic passage that prohibits turning the Song of Songs, Shira Shirim, into a song that we would sing for pleasure. Okay, now, someone might argue and say, well, of course, that's the Song of Songs, that's Shir Shirim. But other biblical verses are not a problem, just that. So Rashi goes out of his way to point out, no, it's the exact opposite. Rashi says, even the Song of Songs, even Shir Shirim, which was intended to be sung, even that is problematic to turn into a song that we would sing for pleasure. How much more so any other biblical verse? This Talmudic passage, according to Rashi, prohibits all songs whose lyrics are biblical verses. Uh, the Mogad Avraham, Rav Avraham Gumbiner, who's on the page in Shilchan Aruch, he agrees. He also he writes as follows. He says, those who at feasts sing the biblical verse, Odcha Kianisani, are violating the halacha. And the same is true about many songs that are sung at happy get-togethers, for they contain verses, and the Torah then girds herself in sackcloth and declares, your children have made me like a song. He says, during the Hagim, during the holidays, in Shul, then it's a mitzvah to sing these songs. It's a mitzvah, because then you're praising God. It's not being sung for entertainment. But he says, it appears to me that the only songs of biblical verses that are permitted to sing at a meal are those that were specified, like on Shabbos, but all other songs with biblical verses are forbidden. So now this is like crazy what's happening here. A, a country song sung by a goy in Nashville with beautiful lyrics that tell you to be patient with your spouse, that would be permitted. And 
much of Jewish music just became forbidden. Okay, but okay, that's a Gemara and that's the Mugen Avram. But how do people paskin? Like in real life, how does this come out? So if you look in the Mishnah Bura, in Simen Taf, Kuf, Samach, Sif Gimel, Sif Kat, and Yud Dalad, Rav Yisrael Meir Cohen, the Chofetz Chaim, quotes verbatim the Mugen Avraham saying that you are not allowed to sing songs that have biblical verses in them. And in case this is not crazy enough already, the Stei Chemed, that's Rechaim Chizkiah Medini, so this, he's writing here in Ot Zion, Simon Yud Beis, Dibur Moscow, the Gazru. He says that the, 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 the problem is that it's being sung for, for pleasure, for fun. Uh, if it's being sung as praise, that's not a problem at all. Okay. Rav Moshe Feinstein goes a step further and he says, it's not just biblical verses that are the problem. Quote, this is Rav Moshe Feinstein in your day, Chelek Beis, Amma 241. He says, it's possible that the prohibition of turning Torah into songs applies also to blessings, for they are also considered words of Torah, as it ex- is explicitly taught in Tractate Shabbos, one, page 115, that blessings are classified as words of the oral Torah. And it is logical that even words of oral Torah are like the verses of the written Torah regarding the prohibition of they made me like a violin, for why should we make a distinction? Rav Moshe Feinstein rules that ideally a person should not listen to quote-unquote Jewish music that contains biblical verses or contains lines from the Torah Shabbat from the oral tradition. So, we're working so hard to run away from the quote-unquote secular music, the Arabic music that, remo- that, that the Rambam said we would be fools to run away from if the verses, if the lyrics are, are morally inspiring lyrics. And what are we embracing? We're embracing something which according to many post game, according to many legal authorities, is 100% forbidden, which would be Jewish music that has biblical verses or, or, or oral Torah in it. Fine. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to conclude my initial presentation. I hope people ask questions on this. I want to conclude my initial presentation with a very, very important uh, warning. I heard this from Mayor Trivitz Shlita. He's a post in Harnof in Jerusalem. He cited the Stipler Gon. The Stipler Gon said that today, Klyasrel, the Jewish nation, is depressed. And they need music as their antidepressant. And therefore, the Stipler said, we're going to suspend the rules prohibiting music in our generation because the Jewish nation can't make it without that. So, I know that it's true. I know that many people, if they don't have music they get depressed. So even though certain types of Jewish music with biblical verses and and Torah Shabal Peh, etc., it might be forbidden, but it could be that we're dealing with sick people who, who need music to survive, and therefore we should permit that. And how much more so if what you're listening to is a piece of secular music written by a non-Jew that has beautiful lyrics, beautiful inspiring lyrics. According to Rebuta Levi, it might even be a love song. Obviously, it shouldn't be a depraved love, love song. It would have to be a beautiful love song. But, but that would all be permitted, certainly in this day and age when, when, when the, the Jewish nation is depressed. Um, but again, even without the Stipler Goins Hetter, you have a Hetter from, of listening to non-Jewish music that, uh, that does not have uh, bad lyrics. There's no problem there whatsoever. Uh, and... This is so, so important for people to know. Now, by the way, I have heard from many people that there are Kabbalistic sources that say that the tuma, the spiritual impurity of the composer, goes into the song. Okay. I haven't seen the source. This may or may not be true. But what I can tell you is this. In every other area of halacha, when all of the mainstream legal authorities, the Rambam, Rashi, uh, the, 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 the later post giver, Moshe Feinstein, when they all permit something, if there's an esoteric Kabbalistic source that comes and forbids it, we do not impose that stringency upon the entire Jewish nation and tell everybody, you have to behave this way. So, I certainly would apply that principle here. 
when all the major sources are telling you that you can listen to Arabic music, you can listen to a song with beautiful lyrics that was written and perhaps even performed by a non-Jew, if there is an esoteric Kabbalistic source which is stringent, I'm not going to start telling the masses they shouldn't listen to, to quote-unquote secular music. That is not the way that we, we rule in halacha. Uh, and therefore, this wonderful person who, who wrote this question, uh, I, I want to give him or her permission. You can go back and you can listen as long as the lyrics are inspiring and beautiful and moral. Go back and listen and, and, and get your chizuk there. You, 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 you're making life far too difficult for yourself and life is difficult enough already. Uh, if there are questions, I would love to answer questions on this. Kelman, I'm curious. Um, the person that asked the question uh, also asked about shows. They said music and shows. I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. So again, if if there's something that is uh, bad in the show, if the show is a violent show or the show is a sexually explicit show or something like this, okay, so we don't want to be exposed to that stuff. right? We're trying to live a, a, a better life. But if the show is a wonderful show, so then there's nothing wrong with exposing yourself to that show. That if, the, if the show is morally inspiring, then there's nothing wrong with that. Um, uh, my, my wife just showed me a video, uh, which is a history of Churchill in, in World War II, and, uh, and, and what, what the whole life of Churchill was, and how did the whole thing happen, and how did he become the head of, of, of England, and how did he conduct himself during... It was a, it was a very inspiring, very heroic movie and there was nothing inappropriate in it there was uh no explicit violence there was absolutely nothing sexual in the movie it was just about a man who stepped in and was a hero at a crucial period in history and i can't imagine banning such a thing halavai halavai every single jew would be inspired to heroism that would be an amazing thing so i think you would use the same guidelines for the shows as for the as for the, the music, if it's something that is inspiring and good, so then it's very hard to tell all of Jew, Jewry that they can't see it. Now, are there holy people who, because of their level, will not expose themselves to any music? Yes, certainly. Uh, and, and we admire those people. Those are what we call Bali and Efesh, people at a high madrig, and they're not going to go to shows either, and that's wonderful, and that's appropriate. But to tell the entire Jewish nation you can't listen to, to, to music or, 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 or non-Jewish music or, or go to a, a show produced by a non-Jew, it's, that's not the halacha. And it's, so it's very difficult to say that that is how all people should conduct themselves. Thank you so much for taking my question. I actually did ask the question about secular music. I appreciated that you spent so much time um, going through all of that. It really turned everything on its head for me. Um, I guess my, my question is um, in terms of how I appear to the rest of the community and how my kids appear when it does seem like it's frowned upon um, for them to be exposed to music that isn't Jewish. Yes, that is the question. You are a very insightful person who is plugged into reality. So like this, uh, it's... It's not good for your children and it's not good for the community uh, to put it in their face. Uh, and therefore, I wouldn't drive up to the base Yaakov to pick up my daughters with uh, a song from Elton John blasting on your radio. That's probably a mistake. Um, however, uh, your children have to learn that there are certain things that are appropriate privately and there are certain things that are appropriate in public. And since the community is minig, is to only listen to Jewish music. So then in public, that's what we'll do. Uh, and if, if you're making a simcha and you're having the public come for the simcha and you're going to be playing music at the simcha, so you'll play music that is acceptable to all the people who will be there. However, in the privacy of your home, there is absolutely nothing wrong with listening to wholesome music, uh, which is different than what the kids hear in school. And certainly for you, which was the, the primary reason that, that I wanted to permit this, for you, uh, listen when you, at, at home, blast it on your, on your, on your radio or you know, in, in, the, in, the, in your house. And when you're walking around, you can put it on your headphones. That's fine too. 
right? So there's no reason that you should restrict yourself. However, you're correct. We do have a certain amount of sensitivity. We don't want to antagonize people uh, for any reason. If if people in my community were upset about blue clothing, so even though there's no Torah pro 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 prohibition on blue clothing, I wouldn't wear blue clothing because, like, why bother people? Uh, so you're you're right. We have to be sensitive, but it's not forbidden, and there's no reason for you to wipe this out of your life and lose that emotional support. Does that help? Yes, very much. Thank you so much. You're very, very welcome. I love the question, and uh, I think you're going to find some amazing music out there that's very, very inspiring. There's some amazing stuff. Uh, I, I noticed, I, you know, I mentioned Nashville, but sometimes the country songs are, you know, there's bad country music too, which we shouldn't listen to, but sometimes the country songs are very wholesome, and they talk about values that, that we agree with. Uh, about patience and fidelity and things like that. And they often will say it in, in language that is perfectly acceptable to us. Uh, and to miss out mm -hmm. on that sort of inspiring musr set to music is chaval. I'll have to check it out. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody, for being part of this program. It, you cannot imagine how much it means to me. And I just love speaking to you guys at the Shear, and I love speaking to you on the phone as well. And please continue to listen in and ask your questions. I really, I really value it. I wish you have a great week, and I'll speak to you soon. Copyright LawrenceKellerman.com. All rights reserved.